so Indians they understand the importance of gold because as I said it is a pretty old civilization and when the civilization is very old people know what is going to safeguard them when the society is going to collapse because that collapse Indians have seen for many many years you know repeatedly so one empire will rise and then they will fall and the other empire will come so in between there is a transition period so people know that it's only gold and silver that is going to safeguard their wealth so they know about it very well but i'm kind of worried about the americans they don't really understand the importance of gold at all Welcome to Rethinking a Dollar. Today, I'm excited to have my guest, Mr. Mahuzadan Raj. He's a professor at Sat Gautam University in India. Today, Dr. Raj joins us to give us an update on the current situation in India with the currency crisis, as well as to give us his thoughts here on what's happening in the, with the Federal Reserve and Donald Trump and everything like that. So, Dr. Raj, welcome to Rethinking a Dollar. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me on your uh, show, and uh, I'm happy to you know be with you and uh, have the discussion. Thank you very much. Well, I'm excited that the fact of a mutual friend of ours recommended we sit down and have a conversation on what's happening in India. And so since the whole cash crisis began several months ago, I know there's a lot of things happening now with the push of going digital via mobile and things like that. So I'm looking forward to getting your take on that. But before we dive into that conversation, I typically start off with some rethinking dollar questions. And the first question is, what comes to mind when Dr. Raj hears the words rethinking a dollar? Yeah, sure. Because uh, uh, I will take you very quickly to the history of dollar and uh, not only dollar, but all other currencies. Because remember, dollar is just currency. It's not money. When we talk about uh, monetary you know, system, we have to differentiate between money and currency. So money is the common medium of exchange and currency is that is uh, circulating into the economy. So before I think 1933, dollar was basically a name of the underlying unit weight of gold at uh, whatever you know rate it was you know exchanging i think it was 33 dollars per ounce so what happened is after that uh, we have the uh, gold uh, you know exchange standard up to 1971 uh, and uh, i'm sure uh, you also know that in 1971 15th august uh, the then us president richard nixon uh, closed the gold window and after that uh, dollar is only uh, just a you know paper currency, it's a piece of paper basically. So and after that, uh, especially after 1971, the Federal Reserve, which is the Central Bank of America, is you know constantly increasing the uh, supply of dollar. And because uh, the supply of dollar is increasing, so the purchasing power of that dollar uh, is going down rapidly. In I think in 90 years time, it has lost something like uh, 90 cents of its purchasing power, and it's continuously going down. So uh, we definitely will have to rethink not only dollar, we have to rethink all the fiat paper currencies that we have today in the world. I mean, historically speaking, this is for the first time in the history of the mankind, the whole world is basically on a fiat paper currency standard. This has never happened. Uh, for 6,000 years, you know, human beings have used uh, either gold or silver as uh, money, as a common medium of exchange. But this is for the first time that uh, a paper or currency be, is being used. And uh, again, historically speaking, uh, any experiment in the history with paper currency has always failed. So this experiment is also going to fail. Uh, dollar ultimately is going to fail. Rupee, which is the Indian you know, uh, fiat currency, is going to fail. Pound. All these currencies were basically names of the underlying uh, unit weight of uh, precious metal for example gold or silver so the governments around the world have very cleverly removed the underweight of gold and just kept the name and they are calling it money which is not money so i think americans uh, should be very very worried about this issue same uh, with all other you know citizens of other countries for example in india i have to you know if i have to discuss india so on uh, 8th november night the prime minister of india mr narendra modi came on national television and he announced that from tonight these 500 rupees and uh, 1000 rupees note which is like uh, 5 dollar and 75 point uh, dollar notes will no longer be uh, legal tender and it will become just piece of paper so dollar is nothing but a piece of paper and when uh, its value will come down to zero people will uh, realize this fact but i hope that people will wake up 
before it reaches its you know uh, value of zero and they try to move to other alternative you know uh, either currency or money right good explanation there now my question would be over here in the western world not too many of us actually pay attention to world events and so the idea that you mentioned that it's worth americans as well as other citizens taking time to actually check into this why do you think that you know studying and and being more familiar with your current uh nation's monetary you know issues and monetary policy will probably be one of the most important things someone can do at this point in time in history yeah because as i said uh, uh in this time of history the world governments as well as the world central banks are running the experiments that they have never run in past uh as i said it we are all on a fair paper currency standard as well as uh, the governments the corporates and the private individuals are heavily into that this much amount of that was uh, historically never there uh, for example uh, the unofficial figures about the american you know uh, federal government's debt is something like 220 uh, trillion dollars or official debt itself is around 20 trillion dollars by now which is a huge amount i mean uh, if uh, the uh, our audience or our viewers will you know check out you know how much a trillion dollar is then they will find out that it's a pretty huge amount so now uh, as the austrian school economist uh, ludwig von mises says that our whole civilization depends on the understanding of the science of uh, human action which is basically economics so uh, we all carry the responsibility of our societies on our shoulders and if you want to successfully carry out the responsibility and save our societies from collapsing then we all will have to understand economics and once we understand economics then only we can you know uh, understand the events that are going around us so you know uh, as the chinese course says that we are living in a very interesting times so these interesting times are very very dangerous times also uh, this is a matter of basically life and death of people i know that when the second crisis second round of crisis will start the recession is not you know over whatever uh, the recession started in 2007 it is just deepening so when this will really strike people are really get, you know going to get into a lot of trouble so that is the reason why it is very very important to keep a very keen eye on all these events that are not only going inside our countries but all around the world because you know uh, we are living in a globalized world right now so if something happens in the united states of america that is going to have an impact on the indian economy for example or something happens in india that is going to have an impact on america that is going to have, you know, have an impact on other countries also so that is the reason why you know uh, citizens should be very very keen on understanding all these issues all right now my question is now you because you're currently in a city called i think it's garat india and so give me an idea uh, or what's what's on your mind you're currently in india right now what's what's the feeling on the streets for those that are dealing with this cash situation is it still considered a crisis it has it improved or let's dive into what's happening now on the ground in india as we speak sure see uh the situation is uh, uh, still worsening. For example, just a couple of days back, you know, I read in the local newspaper that 70% of the automated tailor machines, ATMs, are still empty. So banks are not dispensing the full, you know, amount that the uh, depositors want for withdrawals. Although the Reserve Bank of India, which is the Central Bank of India, has lifted all the limits on withdrawal now, uh, which were in place for three months. But even after that, you know, they announced something, but the ground reality is that people are still not able to, you know, withdraw full amount of money. And not only that, the government and its, you know, uh, income tax department is, you know, uh, coming very heavily onto the even innocent people who deposited, you know, anything more than you know, a few half a million rupees or something like that. So uh, they are harassing the people uh, in my city, for example, uh, Surat city, which is a uh, a uh, diamond you know kind of uh, hub of world uh, i think around 90 percent of rough diamonds come to my city for polishing mm -hmm. so it is known for its uh, textile industry and diamond industry so most of the textile and diamond industries you know were closed and are slowly opening up but uh, the small you know businessmen are still finding it very very difficult because uh, because of this demonetization uh, and uh, the government pushing for cashless economy people are also uh, waiting and watching because they don't know what the future is so in this uncertain time people are kind of restricting their you know purchasing and everything so they are not buying anything so i see malls are empty shops are not selling you know much of the goods 
so the economy is basically slowly you know kind of slowing down and halting ultimately and uh, not only that the government is you know passing one you know uh, ludicrous you know act after another one which is really going to hurt the economy in the long run recently the deputy governor of the reserve bank of india mr uh, acharya he said that the impact of the monetization is going to spill over into the next quarter also although the indian government is trying very hard to you know uh, put some kind of smoke and mirror try to hide the impact by you know fudging the numbers of gdp and everything but on the ground right now the situation is still worse you know people are finding it very very difficult and as i said the income tax the tax department is now going after small honest entrepreneurs for example in my city right now the raids are going on the income tax departments are raiding chicken shops shoe shops you know small restaurants or you know, gas pumps petrol pumps uh, these people anybody who deposited anything you know more than what they stipulated during the time of the monetization so they are sending them notices and they are asking them to kind of you know explain that from where did they get all this money right. and uh, if they find somebody uh, e- uh, with any kind of big deposit they are forcing them to declare that into narendra modi's uh, you know poor welfare program uh, what what they call in in local language pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana for example right so so, uh, so one yeah, so, right. so- so one question, yeah. So you said they're they're raiding, they're actually raiding shops right now. Looking, I mean, what are they looking for? Looking for you know cash, or I mean, what are they raiding looking for? Yeah, they are looking for basically cash. And uh, I mean, see, recently they have changed the IT law in India, and that gives a total blank check to the income tax officers that without any kind of reason, without any kind of warrant, they can just you know come and raid your home and look after anything they want. and not only that they can basically confiscate your property and say that you know until you clear your case we are going to keep this property with us so that if something we find out then we can recover our money or whatever so they are reading looking for money they are looking for gold silver if somebody is having that in their home so whatever they are you know getting in their hand they are grabbing it and just you know harassing people right now So that's a, that sounds a little bit extreme to actually go into someone's home looking for their property until they settle their accounts with, you know, the, with the government there. And so when this initially happened, it came out of the blue. As you mentioned, you were, you know, just on TV announced that they're going to remove, you know, the $500, $1,000 note. So now they've implemented the $2,000. And since then, I've read a couple articles saying that counterfeiting the $2,000 uh, rupee note has gone crazy. So have they re-implemented a new, uh, a smaller denomination notes for the $1,500 at all or... Have they just kept the two thousand? They have kept the two thousand note, and uh, they are going to bring out another plastic note of ten rupees, which is a very small amount. But uh, they are not doing anything. Recently, the finance minister Arun Jaitley categorically denied that they are going to introduce thousand rupees note. They are going to continue with the two thousand rupees note, and there are no new plans of bringing out any new notes. Also, in fact, not only counterfeiting notes are there. Counterfeiting is, you know. Uh, one issue the rbi is in a hurry printing notes with lots of mistakes on it i am hearing frequent cases for example in my state itself the state of gujarat uh, atm machines are dispensing 500 rupees note which is blank on one side really and uh, no, yeah and not only that many notes have lot of printing mistakes because these people are in lot of hurry to replace you know 86% of the total money supply which they pulled out during the demonetization phase uh and uh, from many atms you know kind of funny money is also coming out with all kind of jokes and everything so i don't know uh so one side you have counterfeiting money and on one side you have rbi's currency which is also it just looks like counterfeit so rbi is saying they don't worry just use this you know currency we have no you know system right now to take everything back so people don't know which is you know a legal currency and which one is a counterfeit currency right now so my question another question would be so with the 2000 rupee note is that the highest denomination you guys have or yeah. is there okay yeah, so yeah so do people walk around or i mean a good portion of the population i, I think i read that it's like 1. Point something billion people there of which a good a good majority are below the you know poverty line and so i imagine the 2000 rupee notes aren't in everyone's possession And so with the small denominations even in making trend and doing transactions how is the is there enough cash going around to actually give someone change if they purchase something with 2000 rupees or would they be stuck with a lot of you know small change and coins and things 
Yeah, see, uh, that was the situation for three months. Now, slowly, situation is improving because uh, the currency is coming back. So, like we have the problems, you know, two, three months ago, that kind of problems people are not facing right now. But still, uh, if you have, I mean, lots of 2,000 rupees note, it is going to become a little bit difficult to find the change in everything. So, situation is improving a little bit, but not by much, basically. Yeah. Now, another question would be why, in your opinion, why, why India and why now? There, I mean, there's, as I mentioned, there's one point something billion people in India. And so some people say this is like a test run to see how it works, how they can roll out, you know, whatever. Share with me your thoughts. I mean, is this, I mean, why India, why now? Uh, why India, why, why right now is because uh, for, for that answer, we have to look to the present prime minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi. So let me tell you in the beginning itself that the whole decision of uh, demonetizing 86% of the total money supply, currency supply, was purely political. It was not an economic decision. Uh, see, uh, I have to take you back very quickly in the history. So uh, in the 2014 run-up to the prime minister's you know, election, Lok Sabha election, the uh, central election, Narendra Modi and his BJP party, they were making lots of promises about uh, bringing back uh, the so-called, uh, you know, black money, uh, which is uh, basically uh, uh, income that is not declared to the income tax department of India. Uh, so they were saying, the reports were saying that in the Swiss banks, there is a lot of black money lying idle. So he was promising that, okay, I will bring back all this black money into India and deposit something like 1.5 million rupees in every poor people's account. If you vote for me, I'm going to do this thing. So uh, on basis of these kind of promises, he won the election with a thumping majority. After winning the election, two years passed by, 2016, and he was not fulfilling this promise of his. It, it come out that there was you know, not much of you know, black money actually in the Swiss banks. So the whole matter was you know, pretty cold. And a lot of you know, local elections were coming up. And uh, this uh, BJP party of Narendra Modi has a majority in uh, the upper house, uh, lower house of the parliament, but they don't have the majority in the upper house. So uh, they were finding it very difficult to push their, you know, whatever uh, you know, whimsical, you know, kind of policies they were having. So they required to win state elections also. So he figured out that if I can, you know, uh, crack down on the black money that we have in India, then maybe, you know, that, you know, uh, gamble will play and, you know, that will convert into more votes and more uh, local election wins for him. So that was the reason, the desperation of uh, Narendra Modi for winning the election, you know, kind of resulted into this. Uh, I'm sure the idea is, you know, already out there in the uh, world, but somebody must have told him and he basically implemented the, uh, this idea. Remember the past government, the uh, United Progressing Alliance, uh, UPA government, also thought about this issue, but they, they realized that this, this particular policy will be very, very difficult to implement and it will be disastrous for poor people. So that's why they just thought about it, but they did not implement it. But it, uh, it took this, uh, this person, Narendra Modi, to implement this kind of you know, crazy idea in India. So it was purely political decision. It has nothing to do with economy. And once they implemented the policy, they, they figured out that it was not going as they wished for. So they made frequent changes. Like uh, within one month time period, they made something like 125 changes. That now this is OK. Now that is not OK. So that shows that how, how prepared they were for all this, the fallout of this policy. And even today, they are making changes in their policies. Right. Now, I guess the push was also to make everyone you go digital or have use their mobile phones and give them automatic accounts uh, that they have to do everything through automatic deposit. How's that playing out so far? No, uh, I mean, see, initially when they announced this policy in the, in the evening of 8th November, uh, there was no mentioning of cashless economy. There was nothing digital economy or nothing like that. The three objectives that they kind of pointed out was one to root out black money. Second was, second was to root out the counterfeiting color currency. And the third was fighting terrorism on the Kashmir border, which is you know a very troubled part of India. So there was no talk whatsoever of digital currency and digital or cashless economy. So what happened is after 15, 20 days time period, they realized that their story was not going according to their plans. 
so that's why they started to change the whole you know uh, story of the demonetization and then he suddenly started pushing the whole idea that we are doing this for making you know india cashless and what happened after that is obviously because india is 90% cash economy there are so many you know poor people uh, in india so this was never going to work so he realized that cashless is not going to work so they again changed the story and they are now saying that it's not cashless economy but less cash economy so now they are saying that okay if we have digital currency and digital economy cashless or less cash economy again we can root out black money by using that and we can you know remove corruption but remember the whole objective of the whole policy is to bring down you know bring as many people as possible under the tax net so right now the indian government is also if you see the accounts they are basically insolvent they cannot repay whatever debt they have so the government is you know kind of you know hungry for more and more resources so that's why they are trying to bring in as many people as possible into the tax net and that is the reason why they are making you know this push for uh, cashless economy so that they, they can track everybody so recently they announced that uh, even if the taxpayers on it taxpayers if they want to uh, file the returns the income tax return they need they need to have this aadhar card which is like uh, a social security card of india these days mm-hmm. so they want to connect that with the bank account so then they can easily track that where people are spending their money and whether they have money more than what they are declaring in their returns etc so the whole idea has nothing to do with you know corruption or black money it's just people want to control these politicians want to control people they want to track their income and they want to basically tax them as much as possible right that that whole transaction you just kind of listed about you know keeping a track on people's spending and making sure it lines up with what they're reporting do you see that i mean that kind of sounds like you know that's something that might want to be rolled out over on this side of the water as far as being able to actually monitor and see how much you earn how much you spend and where you spend it to so that they can kind of you know oversee your life i mean it's kind of very invasive wouldn't you say yeah absolutely this is absolutely you know very very invasive and they they are not only that they just want to control people's thinking also so this is basically people in you know, a violation of people's privacy you know uh, and they are not discriminating at all they are saying we just want to control everybody so of course this is invasion of privacy and everything right now one of the reasons i i find it very interesting and in find out more about what's happening in india because i i see it how it it's more than just a isolated event in india i believe it's something that's going to happen globally so the whole idea of rethinking a dollar i think is it, it ties into the idea that you know privacy will will be removed they want to narrow their options down to a digital form and so let's get into what's happening over here now in the western world give me your thoughts on uh, president trump now he's less than 100 days in office and there's a lot of you know a lot of you know unhappy people with what he plans on doing what he's currently doing and what he may be allowed to do give me your thoughts on trump briefly right so uh when donald trump was basically running for the presidency see basically mike i don't have any expectations from the politicians so uh i was not really expecting much from him but i was kind of liking him only because he was troubling the establishment in america basically the neo conservatives and everybody so not only the democrats are you know basically uh furious at him but also the republicans so if you see right now they are the ones who are trying to block you know whatever moves he is making one thing i was you know kind of looking at him was the foreign policy front but i think over there he is you know not doing anything you know serious he just wants to start another war probably with north korea and he's not withdrawing troops from the middle east he just increased the in fact budget of the uh defense uh, the pentagon by something like 54 billion dollars so on that front i i am you know uh, i was not really you know kind of expecting too much but i thought that maybe he is going to kind of pull back the you know troops like what in fact ron paul wanted to do but he's not doing that also on the economic front he is pushing all this protectionist policies which is obviously economically kind of ignorant because protectionism is not going to you know kind of you know uh, bring back jobs or you know safeguard america's standard of living what he should be doing is he should be kind of you know allowing uh, free trade and free foreign trade and free internal trade instead of having more and more controls so uh, i am i'm i'm not you know kind of uh, at all surprised if he's not going to fulfill his promises because as i said i i really don't expect much from the politicians 
Right. Now, the question is, with his uh, drain the swamp policy or, or, or rhetoric, as well as his one trillion plus infrastructure building, things like that. And as you hinted at earlier, we're, you know, a couple of days, if not a couple of weeks away from hitting 20 trillion in debt. How will the 20 trillion in debt, you know, is it is it something that should be talked about? Because I think here in America, most people don't even really care or never mind, never don't know, any, know anything about it, really. So how will 20 trillion impact, you know, the globe for the most part, as far as confidence in America's ability to either repay or default on our on our debt? What, what are your thoughts with 20 trillion dollars and factored in with Trump's one trillion dollar plan? Yeah. So any kind of, you know, debt is obviously dangerous for the economy. So uh, Americans, they think that they owe that to themselves, which is not basically true. So what is going to happen in the end? The only choice that Americans are going to have is, you know, uh, either repudiate the debt or just default on the debt. Or when the foreign governments like Chinese government or the Japanese government will stop buying the U.S. Treasury bonds, ultimately the tab is going to be picked up by the U.S. Central Bank. So when they start to do that, uh, basically, they are going to create a lot of you know, inflation. They are going to print a lot of dollars and that is going to raise the prices. So far, it has not happened because most of the, you know, those dollars that they printed went abroad and they created bubbles and you know, imbalances into you know, foreign countries. Also, it went into the asset bubble, the stock market. So Americans will have to be very, 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 very worried about this huge amount of debt that is hanging over them. So debt means basically you are borrowing from the future generation. So not only today's generation is in trouble, the you know future generation, which is not even born right now, they are going to be born with all kind of debts on their head. I was just reading on Drudge Report that uh, an average American, when he dies, he's dying with something like 64,000 US dollars debt on his hand. Right. So ultimately, you have to repay this debt one way or other way. So the confidence in the American economy right now you know is already slowly going down i feel like the american empire uh, is you know s slowly collapsing and just like any other empires you know in the past it's financially economically draining itself into all this you know uh, useless wars in middle east uh, where they are spending trillions and trillions of dollars for nothing uh, uh, the uh, petrodollar system is also slowly i think coming down saudi arabia is in trouble for example and uh, I was just checking some figures. The Chinese currency uh, yuan, renminbi, is also slowly increasing in the international payment of currency. So I think if you see historically, uh, every country who becomes an empire, their currency has you know something like 70 to 90 years of time period for being an international you know payment you know system payment currency. So I think uh, dollars time is already I think uh, due, and I think it is. Uh, going to retire and maybe some other currency, probably the Chinese currency will uh, take over in future. So the Americans will have to be very, very careful because the whole standard of living right now, I mean, whole means, you know, uh, you know a big chunk of standard of living of the Americans depend on this petrodollar system and the uh, dollar being the international, you know, payment system. Uh, and that is the reason why all these countries like India or Vietnam, Bangladesh, China, they are producing goods and services and they are sending it to America. And in exchange of that, America is just printing, you know, dollars and giving it to them. So you guys are having kind of, you know, I mean, you in the sense, the Americans are having a kind of free ride. So when the dollar will stop being an international currency, Americans will have to work very, very hard. I think even right now, Americans have no retirement age, I guess. And most of them are, you know, uh, working because they have a lot of debt on their head. So they have to think about their, you know, monthly bills and everything. So this is a very, you know, critical situation right now. Right. I do agree. Now, let's talk a little bit about, you know, when as the empire, as you mentioned, as it, as the time shift, as we go, as uh, the, the, what's considered the greatest nation on the planet is no longer the greatest based upon the fact that no one wants, you know, to put up with our, you know, us sending them paper and they sending us goods. What will it look like when the shoe's on the other foot? How will the 300 plus million Americans in this country, how will our lifestyles be? I mean, a lot of the, you know, developed nations and third world countries, you know, don't even have the bare minimum. Can you foresee a time where, you know, the, the underdeveloped nations become because they actually have goods and services and product that people need, whereas in all we produce is paper and debt. Can you see when, you know, our, our living standards may not be quite as good as they are now and may somehow resemble that of a third world country? 
Oh, uh, I don't know whether they will go at the level of the third world country. Should not because uh, I think uh, the problem is with the American government, but I guess uh, not with the people. And what I am seeing right now, and I mean uh, seeing in the sense I'm expecting that uh, whenever the crisis will hit, America basically will disintegrate into smaller states. I'm I'm already seeing some secessionist movement going on. People are talking about you know California, Cal, Al exit, or for example. or Texas saying that they want to get out so i am sure that uh, many states in you know united states of america are pretty good so it will depend on what kind of policy you follow once the federal government is going to become weaker i mean you have a very good legacy with you uh, of capitalism and private property rights and everything so if uh, you bring back those policies right policies then i don't think so you have to go back to the standard of the third world countries Uh, but if you continue to follow socialism and communism then uh, uh, they, those days are not very far when probably you, you know the american standard of living will go down to that level so right. ultimately it will depend yeah on what kind of policy uh, americans are going to you know people are going to decide that the country is going to follow uh, if they follow capitalism then of course you know future is you know better but if they follow socialism then there are definitely going to be problems. Right. And speaking of capitalism and socialism, there's a there's a growing trend here of, you know, more socialistic type policies where, you know, our countries we're so spoiled where people want free things. People want free healthcare. Like right now the whole Ryan Care or pilling up Obama's uh, healthcare plan. All these policies right now are based upon the fact that people want something for nothing. And so the idea of capitalism is actually considered somewhat evil now by most people because there's those that have and there's there's majority that don't have. So I see us going more towards the latter in a very uncomfortable and unpleasant way. So that's why that's kind of why I hinted at the idea that more third world if if not third world maybe second world to where you know the idea of just being able to go down to your local Walmart and just buy up everything for cheap those days may not be, you know, a plentiful. So that's kind of why I hinted at that. So as we draw towards the end of our conversation, I want to get your thoughts on how uh, precious metals and sound money practices are received in India and how important they might be now if you are of that you know school of thought that of how to preserve your wealth sure in india i mean in, uh, gold and silver is in people's blood so mm-hmm. it's in the culture so uh, and remember india is a very old civilization civilization uh, uh, like 5000 year old civilization and india has always used either gold or silver as uh, the money so in fact the name rupee the uh, present name of the indian currency comes from a sanskrit word called rupa which means silver so the first coin that uh, the uh, suri dynasty emperor sersa suri minted was a silver coin and he gave it the name rupee so as i said uh, indians you don't have to you know uh, explain the importance of gold and silver to indians you know especially the you know women folk they know about that very well so when uh, for example when they are getting married they are you know they are going to wear a lot of gold jewelry and they are going to buy all those things and that is like a uh, kind of for safety of their future so uh, in dowry also they get a lot of you know gold and ornaments and everything and uh, i don't know the exact figures but right now uh, <clears throat> i'm i'm uh, reading in the newspapers that uh indian household total together put uh, they own something like more than 20000 tons of gold so yeah. india yeah 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 so india is uh, number one gold consumer every year the consumption of gold is something like more than 1000 tons so so indians they understand the importance of gold because as i said it is a pretty old civilization and when the civilization is very old people know what is going to safeguard them when the society is going to collapse because that collapse indians have seen for many many years you know repeatedly so one empire will rise and then they will fall and the other empire will come so in between there is a transition period so people know that it's only gold and silver that is going to safeguard their wealth so they know about it very well but i'm kind of worried about the americans they don't really understand the importance of gold at all I remember America is a very young country right uh, it you know achieved the independence only in 1776 and a uh, country of basically immigrant population so they don't have any history of gold although i think in constitution you know uh, the founding fathers they did talk about gold and silver uh, but uh, americans i don't think so they understand the importance 
gold is the ultimate insurance policy against all these kind of uh, government you know shenanigans that are going on so when the purchasing power of the paper currency is going down uh, your safeguard is in these precious metals now i'm not a financial advisor i'm just an economist but if you listen to good financial advisors they will always always advise you to keep at least you know 10 15% of your total portfolio into gold and silver precious metals so that will at, at least safeguard your you know 90 85 90% of the other portfolio that you probably will have in bonds or currencies or stock markets for example All right. so yeah no so like so the 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 hedge part i mean i so i'm, I'm a big advocate of sound metal just understanding just you know basic monetary history leads to the fact that coinage was the ideal money period and when paper came into the mix that's when things got that's when that's when people got in problems so that's kind of where we're at now so you kind of hinted that gold is you know and silver being you know something to hedge against against traditional financial instruments such as bond stocks so in in a world where there is a hiccup or a, a big depression recession you know those financial instruments that are have been conventional for so long how will they fare when things hit the fan yeah when uh, the thing will hit the fan i feel all these paper promises are going to go down uh, you see bonds currencies or you know uh, stocks they are basically uh, uh, paper promises and a lot of you know counterparty risk with them so uh, only safe thing right now is basically gold and silver i believe that in today's world whatever is not in your hand is not yours mm. whatever is a promise wherever you have a counterparty risk you are putting yourself in a danger so it is much better to have something in your hand than you know you are depending on somebody's you know promises and ultimately all these promises are going to be broken as especially the indians found out when the prime minister of uh, this country came and said that i no longer back the fiat paper currency it's piece of paper so ultimately that piece of paper achieved its you know kind of uh, value of zero and all those people who are holding that paper in their hand they were in big big trouble So you know, uh, for example, in my city itself, when they announced the monetization, most of the business people ran to the gold jewelry shops, and the gold jewelry shops opened up in middle of the night, uh, and they remained open until you know uh, very early morning, and they sold something like you know tons and tons of gold around you know 500 crore rupees, like millions and millions of you know dollars, you know gold, even in that just one night to all these people. So those who were stuck with the paper fiat, you know, notes, they went and converted. So it is much better that you prepare yourself before the, you know, things hit the fan instead of waiting. Right. As they say that it is better that you prepare hundred years in earlier than one minute, you know, late because one minute you are dead. All right. Wow. Good point there. Now, Dr. Raj, last question here, and this is more so just a. Uh, off the cuff, you know what comes to mind. You know the name of the show is Rethinking a Dollar, and so the Federal Reserve knows what I'm actually referring to. So give me your your short term, your two year, five year, ten year thought on what the Federal Reserve note will look like. You know internationally as well as domestically. Last question. Okay. Uh, see, ultimately, I feel as I say, the dollar is a paper currency. It is going down. I feel right now we have a ra race to the bottom uh, uh, between all the paper currencies. So I don't know which one is going to go down, you know, at the bottom first, but definitely all of them are going down because the governments are following uh, the mercantilist policies that uh, export is good and import is bad. So that's why they are trying to depreciate their currency and boost their export. So that is what most of the central banks are doing, reducing their interest rates right now. The American central bank is, you know, thinking of raising. They have raised right now for 25 basis point. but that will not be for very long because once they are going to raise the rates a little bit higher the crisis is going to hit again the recession is going to start and i'm sure again they will start printing more and more dollars so the i cannot give you a target right but i i can uh, uh, talk about the trend the trend is down for sure ultimately every paper currency in the world is going to hit the zero mark and i don't give a lot of time to that maybe 5 years 10 years you know it will not take very very long for sure right good point there well dr raj i appreciate you sitting down joining us here on rethinking a dollar uh give the audience a chance to i guess find out more of what you do anywhere they can find your work or hear your school of thought or leave us with uh, some somewhere to get in touch with you if need be sure uh so i i live in the city called surat uh in the state called gujarat in india uh 
and i teach in a local university the name of the university is veer narmal south gujarat university and i am in the department of human resource development uh, i teach basically economics as well as uh, history culture uh, research methodology etc classes uh, i belong to the uh, austrian school of you know economics so i'm basically an austrian economist i'm also alumni of the mises institute the mises university i was there in 2008 uh i'm also a blogger if uh, if your audience want to you know follow my blogs then the address of my blog is www.mypraxeology.blogspot.in i also have my youtube channel where i uh, regularly post my video analysis of basically the indian economy so anybody who will want to understand what is going on in the indian economy they can look to my uh, youtube channel the address of my youtube channel is uh, www.youtube.com/user/madhusudanrajtv okay i'll 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 link all of that in the description as well so people can actually go click on the links and and get to you faster sure sure so dr raj thank you for sitting down it's been a pleasure to talk to you looking forward to continue to just you know follow this current situation in india because i think it's uh, something that everyone should be paying attention to being that it's uh you know it impacts billions of people And so thank you for your time looking forward to following your work continuously and uh enjoy your day there thank you for taking time for sitting down with us Thank you Mike for inviting me it was my pleasure thanks see you again